In this video, Shockwave will go head to head with the Dinobot Sun, and it's incredible. What's up Beyonders, James here and I bring you the long awaited return of our coverage of IDW's Transformerverse timeline. Make sure you hit that like button. Today we're covering a Transformer spotlight focusing on the devil Transformer himself, Shockwave. This is written by the legendary Simon Furman. The last couple of spotlights we've covered were Blurs and Orion Pax, aka Optimus Prime. If you are new here, check out the playlist right here and right below the like button after this video to get caught up. So this story begins 600,000 metacycles ago, during the early years of the Great War. So this may have occurred at some point after Megatron conquered Kaon, which we saw in his origin series. The forever logically thinking Shockwave calculates and deduces that this war will deplete Cybertron's resources, eventually leading it to become a dead world. So he decides to create and initiate a program to ensure Cybertron's survival and his rise to power. He dubbed it Regenesis. He told no one of his plans, not even Megatron, because he already knew his warnings would be ignored and that Megatron and his Decepticon brethren were focused on winning the war. Shockwave's first act in this program was to stockpile raw energon, then refine it and distill it into a potent elemental catalyst. The end product of this energon concoction was loaded into warheads and launched into space. Each warhead was designated to end up on a planet with a specific geological profile suitable for energon. One of those planets was Earth. This leads us to the present. After many years, Shockwave's cache of Energon on Earth was the first to bear fruit. The Devil Transformer arrives on Earth at the end of the Ice Age. Now, just to let you all know, this issue came out before the Autocracy Trilogy. We'll see things in this issue that may not align with the events of that trilogy. For example, Shockwave does not mention Megatron and Decepticons being defeated and imprisoned like we saw at the end of the trilogy. However, it still fits and works with the timeline in my opinion. We can just assume that the Decepticons eventually broke out of prison and the war began again. But Shockwave decided to go out on his own. Anyways, Shockwave sees that Earth is having wild energon reactions, and he begins to stabilize them. Despite knowing Megatron will brand him a traitor, he doesn't care. He says, I am committed. There is no going back. In this war, resources will become paramount and Regenesis will ensure that I control the balance of power. Ultimately, I serve only one master, pure logic. As he plants Energon Dampners, Shockwave observes a herd of mammoths slowly dying. He deduces that they are creatures meant for cold climates and are dying due to their failure to evolve and adapt to Earth's hotter climate. He views this as an analogy for Cybertron and the Transformers. He says, they face certain extinction. Our race faces extinction as well. We either evolve or die. Now, unbeknownst to Shockwave, the Dinobots tracked him here, aboard their ship, the Skyfire. All of them, most of all Grimlock, want payback. Slag warns Grimlock that the Energon radiation levels on the planet are off the scale, and that they need some protection or they'll end up in stasis lock. The reason why Shockwave isn't affected by the Energon radiation levels is because as Slag explains to Grimlock, a shield is protecting him. Grimlock tells Slag to come up with a solution, not an excuse. We learn the reason why the Dinobots want to beat the brakes off of Shockwave is that during a mission on Cybertron, they were battling him over an Energon silo. They were close to obtaining it, but Shockwave, realizing he couldn't obtain it, decided nobody would get it then and just straight up destroyed it. Grimlock went to Optimus to approve a mission of the Dinobots going after him, but Optimus told him to forget it. Grimlock, being Grimlock, refused to do that, and that's why they're here. Eventually, Slack comes up with a solution to their Energon radiation problem, which is to use the ship's CR chambers to modify their forms and adapt to the planet's local life forms, aka adopting beast modes. I love this because Furman is paying homage to Beast Wars. The Maximals and Predacons faced the same problem and had to do the same thing to move and function on a prehistoric Earth as well. Another thing Furman is paying homage to is the Marvel Transformer series. This entire story is a modern reimagining of the original Marvel Transformer story 
where Shockwave battled the Dinobots on prehistoric Earth and they all wound up buried for millions of years. What's funny and interesting here is initially Slag was going to give the Dinobots forms of the different species around during the Ice Age. The ship's monitors show a woolly mammoth, a woolly rhinoceros, a giant Irish elk, and a saber tooth, until Grimlock tells him to find other forms with a bite. That's when Slag discovers dinosaur fossils. When Grimlock sees the T-Rex displayed, he says, perfect. After Shockwave finishes planting his Energon Dapners, he calls his ship so he can head to the other worlds that are seated with his Energon. However, when he calls his ship, it doesn't respond. He calculates either some technical malfunction has occurred, or it's not there anymore. At that moment, five beams of light pop up before him. The Dinobots arrive on Earth, ready to demolish him in their new beast forms. Grimlock says, Dinobots, beast modes! They transform and straight up jump Shockwave. He is shocked, pun intended, by this ambush. In his inner monologue, he says, I am struggling to compute how this could happen. I expected that if anyone would track me, it would be Megatron or the Predacons sent by him. Shockwave begins to fight back and uses his logical and rational mind to deduce why the Dinobots tracked him down and why they're attacking him with all their savagery and rage within them. They quickly gain the upper hand in the fight, firing at him with all their weaponry. As he is taking this beat down, Shockwave figures it all out. They did all of this to get revenge and heal their wounded pride after he defeated them in their last encounter. This petty reasoning makes his logic center teeter on the brink of seizure. After being hit with all the Dinobots weaponry while surrounded by flames, Shockwave says in his inner monologue, I cannot process the chaotic nature of these individuals. I simply shut down my higher functions and a new primal subroutine takes root, opening the door to the synthetic equivalent of rage. I evolve. Shockwave comes bursting out of the flames and dominates the Dinobots. He grabs Sludge's tail and swings his body smashing all the Dinobots with it. And then one by one, he takes out all the Dinobots. He is just incensed. He is gone. There is no Shockwave. There is just rage. Once they're all down, he makes sure they don't get up by transforming into his gun mode and firing on them. After the battle, he restores his neural cortex to its normal function. However, even after he does that, he mentions that he feels a momentary rush of sensation, liberation, intoxication, and satisfaction. These things he says he fouls away for later consideration. The Dinobots begin to go into stasis lock because Shockwave's beatdown stripped them of the synthetic flesh that protected them from the Energon radiation. Before he goes into stasis lock, Grimlock tries to attack Shockwave, but the stasis lock takes hold of him. Shockwave, seemingly victorious, begins to dissect this whole encounter. He says, I consider structure and form, action and reaction, cause and effect but I neglect to consider one fundamental, universal constant, chaos. Grimlock outstrategized the master strategist with a mad plan. We see a quick flashback of Grimlock pre-programming the Skyfire to fire on a nearby volcano in case they lost and Shockwave tried to take their ship. When Shockwave attempts to hack the ship, it fires on the volcano. The blast creates a volcanic eruption. The Dinobots and Shockwave are swept and entombed by molten lava. The Devil Transformer falls for now. Now on Cybertron, Megatron has noticed Shockwave is missing. He orders his research facility sealed until he determines whether Shockwave has become an enemy or not. He assigns Bludgeon the job of investigating all of Shockwave's current and archive projects. Fast forward thousands of years later, in the year 2006, a professor Goring and his team of archaeologists in Eureka, Nevada unearth a massive metal purple hand. That's the end of Transformers Spotlight Shockwave. Next up in the spotlights, I'll probably do either Wheelie or I'll do Cliffjumper. I still haven't decided. 
Remember to check out the IDW Transformer playlist right here. Other than that, have an awesome day, and always remember every day to go beyond.